I think a lot about signals. Signals that show people what groups they belong to. Signals that hide the truth. Everybody uses signals to blend, entice, or trap. Grandma Pearl died not long after her stroke, and I've been making bad decisions ever since. Maybe my expectations are too high, or I'm just an idiot. Either way, I ran away from the group home to be with people who called themselves my family. They were the wrong people. They used the words family, brother, sister, and love like lockpicks, stealing trust, and taking self-respect. The only person I remember using the word family correctly was Grandma Pearl. She was a small woman who toured the US as an actress before settling with Grandad, above their theatrical rental shop. I was three when the car accident took Grandad and mom, so I don't know if they used the word family correctly, but I hope they did. I was never as outgoing as grandma, but that didn't bother her. She taught me how to watch people, how to see their signals, and how to listen. When she died, I forgot a lot of those lessons for a while. They called it a family, the family move product. That product could be goods, drugs, or people. The uninitiated, like me, were distracted with food and a dry place to sleep, but it didn't take long to see behind the curtain. Things got too intense with the new family, and I ran. I ran back to my old neighborhood. The buildings were familiar even if my home was gone. The old theatrical shop had been turned into a microbrewery. After an appropriate amount of self-pity, 30 minutes, I wandered the alleys, picking up cans, or scavenging for bits and pieces that could be recycled, used, or bartered. I recognized old faces, but I tried to stay out of sight. It was safer that way. The only place I allowed myself to be seen was the old Lutheran church on the park's far side. Most people who might have known me had aged out of the congregation or died. It was worth the risk because St. Lazarus had a food pantry in the basement and gave out lunches most days, so I wasn't always hungry, which was nice. I found a dry spot near the library to sleep, which seemed like a stroke of luck until it wasn't. I had the contentment that came with being in a familiar place. Little bits of comfort let me believe, for a moment, that I wasn't a screw-up and hadn't trusted the wrong people. That moment scurried away when Stick found me. Stick was a scary asshole. He technically wasn't in charge of the family, but he made it work. He got things done. I have no idea how old he was. He was all corded muscle and could clock in between 20 and 50. He looked half-starved and moved like a stalking predator even with his limp. His left leg was stiff, the knee didn't bend, and any time he sat, his left leg would be splayed to the side like a kickstand on a bike. The leg was why he walked with a cane. The cane and how he used it was why we called him Stick. I don't know why he took the time to track me down. It's not like I was wanted. Maybe it was that I had become property. Property shouldn't just wander off. Sometimes, you feel a person before you see them. The air is different. When Stick was around, the air felt dead and motionless. I knew I was being watched before I opened my eyes. Stick was sitting on a milk crate, his bad leg cocked to the side, and his forehead resting on his cane. I pushed myself out from beneath the ductwork of the HVAC unit I had been sleeping under and slapped the dirt off my jeans. I thought that was you, Stick said as his sharp grin curved up to his unblinking dark eyes. Stick wanted my discomfort. I'd seen him play the intimidation game too many times. He'd act too friendly, and then when you were good and worried, quick movements, a hand around the back of your neck, and violence would be next. Then he'd act like the whole thing was a big joke, like you were friends. And isn't it great that you can joke around with someone who really cared? It worked, too. If you were the unfortunate focus of Stick's attention, you would be grateful. When he smiled and said, just a joke, kid, don't be so sensitive. I'd seen the pattern enough times to know Stick trained people like dogs with his hot and cold game. I didn't like the game, or the fear, so I changed the pattern. Hey, Stick, did you come to help pick up cans? I asked, making sure my smile reached my eyes. I was trying to be pleasant while ignoring the burning nervousness in my gut. It was still dark out, but I could see Stick's expressions well enough. Stick tapped his cane on the sidewalk, and squinted at me skeptically before answering, just checking on my little brother. They were not related. Stick liked to call the uninitiated his little brothers, or little sisters. He forced intimacy into his language. I didn't argue the point. Interactions went best with Stick when you agreed with everything he said. Thanks, man. I complimented, trying to sound genuine and ignorant as I stepped forward and offered him my hand. Stick didn't move, but I could see that this conversation wasn't going as planned for him, and I forced myself not to react to his confusion. 
I couldn't break character or he would know I was playing him. Stick tapped his cane on the ground twice, grasped my hand, and stood. He watched me. I held his stare, but in an open, naive, godless way that I had perfected in front of the mirror as Grandma gave acting advice. While she put her face on, I once asked Grandma Pearl why anyone would practice acting stupid. She pointed her mascara brush at me, and her ditziest Minnesota nice character said, it's easier to be forgiven when people think you're a little dumb, don't you know? Like with most things, Grandma was right. Before I understood what had happened, Stick pulled me into his side and slung an arm around my shoulder. You don't have a name yet. Everyone gets a name, but they don't get to pick it. He paused and gave me a Cheshire Cat grin. I have a name for you, little brother. You are going to be called Slide. Then he held my chin and forced eye contact. Your name will be Slide because I have never seen anyone slide out of stuff faster than you. I can't tell if you do it on purpose or not, and I've been watching. I watch everybody. You do, too. Hell, this might be the first time I've ever heard you talk, so let's celebrate your name, Slide. Stick's smile slipped as he pulled me out of the alley. We'll go do something special. I stayed silent, knowing full well what was coming. Being named meant doing something you could never take back. It was public and would put you in prison if the police ever took the time to look for you. It meant severing yourself from your life before and relying entirely on the family. I had been absent each time naming seemed to be in the cards, but I couldn't duck out this time. There was only one place to go at this time of night that would have an impact, the boca. The boca was a red hole in the wall, with a glass door papered over with grocery ads years outdated. Canned salmon two for one seemed to be the dominant theme. Although there were two large windows, one on either side of the door, you could barely see in. The right window was a tapestry of cigarette promotions. The left window displayed the only swath of uncovered glass with a view of the interior. From the outside, the view was of tobacco, lottery scratchers, and old lady Imitari. Old lady Imitari owned the store. She was a short, dark-haired woman who always wore a long, floral tank top. Grandma Pearl loved the old woman, but said Imitari looked like an old man's thumb all the years she had known her, and Grandma moved to the neighborhood with Granddad 30 years ago. Imitari was a local legend even then because the boca was open 20 hours a day, 365 days a year, and no one else worked in the store. Grandma used to make an extra strong coffee called Baraco and chat with Imitari sometimes. When work in the shop was slow, I would sneak out at night and try to catch Imitari sleeping. No matter the time, I never caught her snoozing and she always saw me peeking at her through the window. I know she saw me because she would uncross her arms and wave her flies water at me. All these memories flicked through my mind as Stick smiled his too wide smile and pushed me into the boca. Imitari flicked her fly water at me in acknowledgement and her attention returned to the small TV she had nestled beside the cash register which seemed to be the old woman's only real tether to the world outside her shop. The inside of the boca was just a long hallway with shelves of convenience foods, drinks, home supplies, candy, and cold meds covering every available surface from floor to ceiling. The only break in the tunnel of products was the glass counter at the back corner of the store. Imitari presided over her mini domain by casually ignoring her shoppers. I tried to make eye contact with the old woman again as Stick pushed me to the back of the shop. But after her initial acknowledgement of our entrance, Imitari's eyes stayed focused on her TV. As casually confident as possible, I walked to the cooler and grabbed an iced tea. Want a drink? I asked over my shoulder, my voice unusually steady given the electric current of anxiety flowing through me. Stick sneered and tapped his cane twice on the ground. His eyes found all the security cameras in the tiny store, a frown creasing his angular features. I followed his line of sight and finally realized what had bothered him. The cameras were fake. They looked like security cameras, but they weren't. There were no wires or lenses, just rectangles and circles in a security camera shape. Stick took a deep breath and tapped his cane on the ground again. There is so much here to see, but no one is watching, he said with a sing-song. Then his sneer turned into a cruel smile. I knew Stick wanted an audience for what he would force me to do. The fact that the security cameras were fakes meant that whatever was going to happen would now have to be significant, an event that the neighborhood wouldn't be able to ignore. My stomach twisted with the thought. Stick waggled his eyebrows at me. He had been watching. He had seen my thoughts, and we both knew he had something terrible in mind. The cane twirled in Stick's hand, 
and then tapped twice on the shop tile. I think I want a little bit of this, Stig said, gesturing wildly with his cane, sending a row of soup cans tumbling to the floor. And a little bit of that, Stick added as another wild gesture sent cups of ramen spinning and knocking glass bottles of hot sauce to the floor. I stood paralyzed, unable to run. I was trapped with nowhere to duck away to. I didn't want Stick to hurt old lady Amatori, and I didn't want Stick to hurt me, either. The truth was, he would hurt both of us no matter what I did. That was just the way Stick was. I'd seen him. I'd seen him show us who he was every day. Then I realized Amatari hadn't moved. She was watching her TV and chuckling at the sitcom as if nothing had happened. Stick glanced at me, confused. I almost felt sorry for the sociopath. His night was not going to plan. Imitari chuckled at her TV again and a crease formed in the middle of Stick's forehead, letting me know that he was beyond angry. He was calm, dangerous, and vicious. People had been left for dead when Stick got this way. Stick raised his cane and flipped it so the handle jutted like a pickaxe. He was going to attack Imitari. Somehow, I moved. I didn't do much, but when I slid forward and grabbed the back of Stick's shirt, the cane missed Imitari, and the sharp handle punctured the thick glass top of the counter just above a roll of lotto scratchers. Old Lady Imitari slowly looked up into Stick's eyes and smiled. Her wide, gentle frown was replaced with a look of joy and something else. Something primal, something hungry. Her pupils were blown and I had the uneasy feeling that I was watching someone be served their absolute favorite meal. Before Stick could pull his cane from the punctured glass, Imitari casually reached forward, grabbed the cane, and pulled the wiry man forward. Small, old, and wrinkled, Imitari stared into Stick's eyes and overpowered him. Stick fell forward across the counter. He tried to push himself back, but Imitari's hand clamped down on his wrist like a vice. Bones ground together as Imitari pulled Stick's hand to her mouth, and with a swift, Subtle movement, she bit off the tips of Stick's pinky and ring finger like she was sampling a cookie. I jumped back next to the cooler as a thin spray of blood arched toward me. Stick screamed and thrashed, but Imitari's small form was static and immovable. Stick was a fly in a trap. No matter how much he struggled, punched, poked, or kicked, he could not break the old woman's hold. Then, slowly, she took another bite. It was strangely fascinating watching the frail form of this old woman I had known for years take bite after bite out of stick. This man, whom I thought of as a predator, a hunter, an enforcer, was crying and begging while an old woman, who looked like a wrinkled thumb in a floral top, quietly devoured him. I was surprised by the lack of blood after the first spray. I'm sure it was Imitari's crushing grip that stanched the flow of blood. The flesh of Stick's arm looked white from the pressure. Hand over hand, Imitari pulled Stick forward. Bones cracked as she gripped higher on Stick's arm, clamped down with her long leathery fingers, and fed the flesh and bone, one concise bite at a time, into her open smiling maw. It was rhythmical in its simplicity, chomp, crunch, chew, chew, swallow. Over and over, the pattern continued until the begging stopped. Stick wasn't dead, he gave up. Not struggling, he laid over the glass counter like a rag doll. He watched me glassily, as Imitari took bite after bite, and I knew he wasn't there anymore. Whatever made Stick Stick had either curled up and hidden in a dark corner of his mind, or had been devoured with his arm. The old woman seemed displeased that her meal had stopped struggling. She shook him, but he flopped, and his head lolled from side to side. Imitari frowned, let go of Stick's arm, and pushed down on the limp man's back. Blood gushed from the ragged stump, and Imitari lowered her mouth and drank from the wound like she was sipping from a garden hose. Stick didn't move. He just grew pale, and eventually, his panic. Shallow breaths ended, and the blood stopped flowing. Then Imitari stood. With a quick tug, she pulled Stick's body over the counter and let it flop to the floor at her feet. Her eyes closed. A contented smile bloomed on her face as the explosive sound of crunching and cracking bones echoed through the small shop. The deafening sound of crunching stopped, and only the buzzing of the drink's cooler reverberated through the small space. Imitari opened her eyes and watched me, a broad smile still on her lips. At that moment, I realized I could hear the drink's cooler so well because I had crawled into it, wedged between the glass door and the shelves. Imitari held me with her gaze as cords of pink flesh lowered from the ceiling and efficiently tidied up Stick's mess, lapping up blood and hot sauce placing cans on shelves, and scooping up cups of ramen with whip-like tendrils. 
Then, the cords of flesh nudged me forward, and I stood before old Lady Imitari. The thing that I had always thought of as a stern old woman handed me Styx's cane. With the same benign smile I remembered from buying red hots from it as a ten-year-old, it waved me away with its fleece water, and the cords of flesh pushed me out the door onto the sidewalk. 